In this video, I'm going to provide an overview of the Symantec plugin for Rhino. Symantec is a data management framework for Rhino that allows users to define custom properties and assign them to Rhino objects. When used with Conveyor, this means that custom properties that have been assigned inside of Rhino can be transferred into the Revit environment and persist as a design progresses into production. I have established a Rhino model here that is based around the conveyor workflow. I have a number of floors uh, defined here in the model, um, defined as surfaces. I also have a series of levels uh, defined as well. Um, so when we import this into Revit, we can expect that we would have a series of floors and a series of levels uh, being imported in. Now the semantic plugin is uh, in many ways a standalone plugin. It can be used um, on its own or in parallel with a conveyor workflow. And it can be accessed by typing in semantic panel inside of the command line. Or if you have conveyor active, you can activate it using the semantic button. So I'm going to activate semantic and what that's going to do is it's going to give me access to this dockable window that allows me to define document level properties and object properties. And I'm just going to dock it right here underneath um, conveyor. So we have those two uh, possibilities uh, working together there. And right now there are no properties assigned to these objects. This is kind of a blank slate at the moment. And what I want to do is start to define a series of properties that are going to describe some data components that might come along with these floors, such as perhaps maybe department information or building categorization. This is a rather simple and abstract setup, but you can kind of envision that these might be indicative of three different buildings that have uh, several different programmatic components assigned to them. And we can use semantic to give it that level of data. To define properties, um, we have what's called a class manager in Semantic. If I activate the class manager, um, classes essentially act as groupings of properties. Um, out of the box, there are a series of internal property uh, classes established um, that let us do a couple of pretty useful things out of the box. If I kind of click select on my objects here, and I say, okay, well, I want to assign these to the internal prop uh, object level. Um, what that's going to do is it's going to allow these objects to now report some interesting things um, and useful things about area. And if these were curves, they would report length. So you're not having to do the area command over and over. If I select multiples, um, it's going to add areas together and show me that there are five objects selected. So it's a pretty uh, useful tool just from that respect. Um, if I go in and I start to define custom properties, you can see that I have this ability to say add a new class. And I have this ability to add an object class or add a document class. An object class are going to be properties that are assigned to a specific object. And a document class are these more global properties that uh, can have uh, impact across the whole document. So I'm going to do add an object class at the moment. And I'm going to define what's what I'm going to call as the building program class. This is going to be properties that are going to relate to uh, the building program and maybe even a, a cost property uh, or two. Um, and since I'm using these uh, floors as my demonstrator here, I don't need to worry about these properties assigned to meshes, points, or curves. I just need them to assign to B-reps, which refer to poly surfaces, trim surfaces, and so on. I'm going to go to add a new property and there are a number of properties one can create. Uh, there are text-based properties, numeric properties, category, boolean, um, and date properties. Um, one of the more powerful properties that we like to use are these categorical properties. And this essentially allows a user to define a drop-down, a set of drop-down options that can be assigned to these objects. So in this case, I'm going to choose uh, property editor. I'm going to name it building. So I want to kind of classify these objects according to which building they belong to. And then I'm going to add in a series of, of properties here that are going to be accessible through a selecting dropdown. So I'm going to maybe have building A and add that to the category dropdown, building B, add that to the category dropdown, and then building C. And add that there. Um, these also have some color overrides to them. So if you want to make these um, colors uh, a little bit more visual um, when you assign these properties, you can click on them and and uh, edit edit their look and feel a bit. 
So I'm just assigning a series of colors here that uh, can differentiate them in my view a bit. So now I have a kind of ready to go collection of properties uh, for assigning the building. And I'm going to go ahead and add another category and I'm going to call this maybe department. So we're going to have a building level of organization, we're going to have department. And here I'm going to say I want retail and I want office and maybe I want a residential and me hotel. So we have kind of conceptually a mixed use complex here. And again, I can go through the process of giving these some color value so they can differentiate themselves from each other. Um, this is also useful. I mean, if you have some like legends assigned, if you have a kind of programming legend that you like to use, you can start to customize your properties according to that legend. Uh, so there's consistency with other information that you might be leveraging at any given point in time. I think this one more of a magenta, like so. So now we have a series of, of departments that we can work with here. I'm going to add a numeric property as well, and we're going to call this the cost uh, per SF, cost per square foot. And I'm going to put this at a default value of 200. And I can also change the numeric format. I'm going to give this a uh, dollars and cents format and go ahead and save that. So now I have three properties here. And I'm going to go ahead and save those. And you can see that we now have a building program class defined. And I'm going to go ahead and select all of my floors and I'm going to assign them to this class. And what that's going to give us now are a series of custom properties that I can start to edit. Um, so if I go over here and say, okay, these are all presently assigned to the same building. I'm going to go through a process of assigning uh, this, this set of floors to building B and this set of floors to building C. So now if I click through these, you can see that that uh, property is held. Um, and this uh, first one here is building A, B, and, and C. And so those groupings of floors are assigned accordingly. Now I can go through this process of assigning maybe a couple of other kind of department level properties. So maybe these bottom floors here are going to be more in the retail category of, of options. Maybe this set of floors here will be office. Maybe I want these three floors to be a, a residential. And then maybe I want these top four floors to be my um, office as well. And then th these two floors here, I can say are hotel. So um, now as I click through these, you can see we have different um, uh, assignments of categories. I may even want to uh, change up some of the cost parameters as well. So if I want the, um, yeah, maybe this building is going to be more more of an expensive endeavor. Um, maybe I'll up that cost per square foot to 250, for example. And maybe this one will be a bit lower in cost and I'll put that at 150. So now we have a series of cost parameters that are, are differentiated across these these hypothetical structures as well. So right now we're still looking at things through kind of a layer view. Um, on these internal properties, what you can see at the document level is that we have this ability to preview things now by these categories we've defined. So layer, um, I can say, well, let's look at it by building. And what it's going to do is it's going to color code and override the, the visual of our floors now based on that category. So if I click on this, you can see this is building B, so it's getting that kind of oranger color. Building C is getting that cyan, and then building A is getting that green. I can also say, well, show me the department, and now it's going to override my visual to reflect the different departmental breakdowns. So this can become a really useful way to quickly visualize and understand the impact of these um, uh, property assignments uh, decisions, especially if you're using categories, which are um, very useful. I can also kind of toggle between different category visualizations down here in the object piece. You can see there's a little bullet point uh, control, radio control button there that lets me toggle between these 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 uh, visualization overrides. So now that I have a few object properties, I might want to define one kind of global property. I'm going to call this uh, at a document class. I'm going to call this the uh, estimation properties. 
and I'm going to create one in particular that's going to relate to contingency. So if I wanted to create a, a bit of a costing model for my project, I may want to have a contingency factor that globally applies to um, all of these um, uh, objects at once when I get into sort of scheduling and so on. So I'll leave the numeric format uh, as it is right there. Maybe I even want to give this a slider interface. So um, anywhere between zero and and two will be that, that slider interface. So I'm going to go ahead and save that. And then I'm going to save that. And you can now see that we have this contingency slider available in semantic. Now this isn't impacting anything at the object level yet. Uh, but what I can do is start using a combination of document properties and object properties to drive what we would call a query of the model. I'm going to close my semantic classes right now, and I'm going to go into my query manager. A query manager is very similar to how scheduling works inside of Revit. It's uh, going to produce a set of tabular data based on the properties that we are creating inside of semantic. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to add a new query, and it's going to basically allow me to build up a set of, 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 of uh, tables um, based around the specific query. So let's just say I want to create a simple query here that's going to be cost by um, uh, building. So we have a couple of cost factors um, that are being applied here. And what I want to do is I want to create a grouping field around my building category. And I'll kind of add in the field name up there as well. And I'm also going to uh, create a, um, a value field. So I have one group field, and I'm going to create one value field in this case. The value field is going to be my total cost. And what I want to do here is I want to start developing an expression. Um, I want to take the area of each of my objects multiply it by its cost per square foot, and then multiply that by the contingency factor at a global level. So the way that I would do this is I would use, use an open bracket. I would say area, uh, which identifies the property. I would multiply that by the cost or SF property, and then I would multiply that by the contingency. Spelling is important. Um, and I want to make sure that this is being reflected as dollars. So I'm going to go ahead and hit save. I now have this query. And if I activate it, it's going to create a little schedule here that's going to have fields for building and fields for total cost. And if I put, bring this over to the semantic panel, I start to adjust my contingency factor. You can see that this uh, query is live updating as I start to manipulate my information. I can also go over here and change up uh, how you know, some of these pieces may, may impact uh, the total cost. So if I go over here and select these two, and maybe I want to change the cost of these top two floors to 300, um, that's going to adjust the total cost of building A, and that's going to be reflected in the schedule. I'm going to do another query, um, this time uh, department cost. And I'm going to create a group field, um, and the group field is going to be based on department. And then my value field here is going to be based around um, the total cost. And my expression is going to be the exact same expression. Um, so area times cost SF times contingency, like so. And I want to make the number format dollars as well. I'm going to hit save and I'm going to activate that query. So now we have the same information being queried uh, two different ways with semantic. Um, we have it cost by building and cost by department. And of course, if I get in here and I start manipulating my contingency factor, it is uh, in fact uh, updating the total costs in both of these queries. If I go in and say, well, now I want to do some what if scenarios and maybe I want to change the top two floors of this building to be a residential. Well, that's going to change up the cost assumption over there. Um, maybe this bottom floor wants to be an office now, like so. And that's going to update those, those totals there as well. So semantic can become this really powerful 
data management uh, tool uh, as you start to build up intelligence inside of your Rhino models. Um, now that I have assigned a couple of parameters and, and properties and groupings, I'm going to go ahead and save this document. And I'm now going to go through the process of importing all of this information into Revit. So I'm going to jump over to the Revit environment. I want to go to the Proving Ground tab and activate Rhino Conveyor. And I'm going to navigate to my semantic example that I've just created, which has all those properties assigned. I'm going to hit Open. And it's going to give us access to the object table where I have levels and I have various sets of floors as well. And I'm going to go to 3D view so I can see this stuff get built up. And I'm going to go ahead and load these objects. 23 elements total. Yes. It's going to design and develop uh, the levels and then the floors. And what you can see if I click on one of these floors and I scroll down, the semantic data has come across in the context of this uh, the data properties. They, the conveyor is creating the shared project parameters that is allowing a lot of this data to transfer. Um, so I can see I have my department, and I have my building, and I have my cost per square foot. It's also bringing over, which uh, could be useful in different contexts, the area as computed by Rhino, um, which may be interesting to compare to the area as computed by Revit in different, in different cases. Um, but what this also allows me to do then is go through this process of building up a schedule uh, with this semantic data as well inside of Revit. So I'm going to go to a new schedule and quantities. I'm going to create a floors um, schedule and I'm going to uh, get my, um, you can see I've got my cost per SF uh, as a shared property. Um, you can see that I have those Rhino, um, I have a couple of Rhino uh, properties being brought in. Maybe I want to bring in the, the Rhino layer um, as well, just as an example. And then we have things like department being brought over, and we also have building as a descriptor. And I'm going to go ahead and hit, oh, maybe I also want to bring over area. So I'm going to hit OK. And now we have a schedule that is containing the information that was designed and developed inside of Rhino with Semantic being populating, uh, being populated inside of a floor schedule inside of Revit. So hopefully this provides a good starting point on how you might think about interoperability, not only from a geometry and geometry reproduction scenario, but also from a data management and data transfer scenario. Um, as I mentioned before, Semantic can be used in tandem with Conveyor, or it can also be a really powerful standalone tool if you're building up conceptual uh, models inside of Rhino and you're looking to assign properties to them through the Rhino interface.